Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this beautiful institution, which, as those of you who have not been here before may not know, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. Robert, my friend from New Haven, had not seen our members recite our congressional mandate before. And in the wonderful North Korean spirit that it embodied, we are going to talk tonight about free speech in America. <laughs> it is important, ladies and gentlemen, to have enclaves of civility in these polarized times and to bring people of different perspectives together so that we can try to overcome the great divisions in America. And in that spirit, I'm so excited about this program and this wonderful conference that PEN America and the National Constitution Center are sponsoring over the next two days. This is the public face of this conference, which has brought together the most prominent free speech thinkers in America, along with the most prominent student activists and university administrators for a series of conversations that are sure to be vigorous. Uh, there will be some serious disagreements. There will be areas of agreement, but all in the spirit of civil and reasoned discourse. And that's what you're going to have the treat of watching tonight. And I know that we're all going to learn a lot from it. I have to plug our upcoming programs, which are so exciting. Gosh, look at this phenomenal uh, roster over the next couple weeks. Next week is the Constitution Judeo-Christian. November 28th, America's worst presidents. November 30th, it's a historical program. November 30th, the constitutional legacy of President Obama. December 1st, in D.C. at the National Archives, the 14th Amendment on its 150th anniversary. December 5th, the history of the Black Lives Matter movement. December 7th, in New York, can call a convention to amend the Constitution with Intelligence Squared. December 8th, Populism, Demagogues, and Constitutional Democracy, featuring J.D. Vance, the author of Hillbilly Elegy. And on December 15th, culminating this incredible constitutional feast is Bill of Rights Day Book Festival with Akhil Amar, former NRA President David Keene, and others. It is a spectacular array of constitutional discussions, and I hope you can join us here at the Center or online at constitutioncenter.org. Those of you who are not members, please join the National Constitution Center so you can find out about these programs and participate in them, and please silence your cell phones. All right, now, ladies and yes, indeed, that is part of our recent discourse and free speech. Um, and now, to begin tonight's program, I think I'll introduce them now, and then you will uh, greet them as they come out. Uh, Floyd Abrams is one of America's leading First Amendment advocates and uh, who has prevailed in his arguments before the Supreme Court in the New York Times, uh, Pentagon Papers case, and Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Storm Irvin, a student activist, graduated from the University of Missouri in December 2015 and is co-founder of Concerned Student 1950. DeRay McKesson is one of the most prominent voices of the Black Lives Matter movement, an organizer, activist, and educator. Suzanne Nossel is executive director of Penn America, and we're going to hear about her great report. And Jeffrey Stone, one of America's most prominent First Amendment scholars, is Edward Levy, distinguished service professor at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming this incredible dream team, Floyd Abrams, Stuart Storm Irvin, DeRay McKesson, Suzanne Nossel, and Jeffrey Stone. Welcome, everyone. We are going to plunge right into it. And you know what? You're, uh, yes, stay the, the, I'm going to give you this seat just so I can look, look at all of you admiringly and keep a, a stern eye on the time as we go. So that, that's absolutely perfect. Um, Suzanne, first of all, thank you for co-sponsoring this conference with the National Constitution Center. We're so excited to be your partners, and you've convened an extraordinary group. Tell us about this Penn America report on the freedom of speech. It is a nuanced report that both concludes that there is no pervasive crisis on campus when it comes to free speech, but that threats from free speech must be guarded against. A rising generation may be turning against free speech. How do you strike this balance, and what are some of your primary recommendations? 
Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for having us here at the National Constitution Center. You know, we tackled this topic of campus speech. PEN America is an organization that has uh, a, a threefold mission, uh, the defense of free expression, the elevation and amplification of marginalized voices, and the fostering of dialogue across political, geographic, uh, social boundaries. And we, as we witnessed these crises, particularly last fall at Yale, at Missouri, uh, the temperature rising on campuses, clashes, uh, hostility, our sense was that the two sides of the debate, to, to oversimplify the advocates of inclusion, student protesters demanding a more fair and equal campus, and free speech defenders concerned that political correctness was running amok, that these two sides were really talking past each other, and that in the long run, if America was to uh, adapt to an increasingly diverse population, a, a population that will be majority minority over the next few decades with white people forming a, a, a minority of the US population, that we were gonna have to come to grips with these issues and find a way to become a more inclusive, more diverse, more equal society, but without compromising the core principles of freedom of speech that have made this country great and that are admired the world over. And so our goal was really to see how can we find some common ground between these sides? Can we reconcile these competing principles? And so we undertook this research and we really tried to give all sides in these debates their due and really analyze and explicate you know, when they make the case against microaggressions or in favor of trigger warnings on syllabuses or where they argue that the campus should be a safe space, you know, what's that all about? What it, what it, why are they making that case? What are the, what's the data they've adduced about the harms that speech can result in? And we, we lay all that out. We also address, on the flip side, what are the free speech defenders worried about? They're worried about you know, the, the campus becoming a closed environment where certain ideas are a priori excluded, where students are being coddled and they're not gaining the skills and capabilities that they're gonna to need to function as adults with agency in society. So we try to give all sides their due and then really set out a set of principles that, at least in our minds, you know, do uh, the best we could do to come up with an approach to embracing the evolution of the campus driving forward to, toward a more inclusive, more equal future on campus, but at the same time refusing to compromise on free expression principles. And basically our argument is it can be done. These things are not fundamentally in mortal conflict. They can and must be reconciled, and it's kind of all of our work to make this, this polarized debate into something that's more constructive and, and to find a basis for going forward. Wonderful. Well, we will flesh out that balance in the course of our discussion, but I want to begin squarely with the constitutional question. This is the National Constitution Center, and the Supreme Court, uh, ever since the 1960s, has been pretty unequivocal about the situations in which speech can be banned, and channeling uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, the court has held that speech in America can only be banned when, it, when it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. It's an extremely speech protective standard, much more than the rest of the world, that does not allow, under the First Amendment, the banning of hate speech, for example, of the kind that could be banned in Europe. Uh, Jeff Stone, you are uh, 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 one of America's leading First Amendment scholars. You are an author of the Chicago Principles, which embraced a version of the American First Amendment tradition, and have concluded as a result that some very hurtful racist speech on campus, including uh, racist speech by students at the University of Oklahoma, cannot result in expulsions because that's protected speech under the First Amendment. Explain to the audience why it is that the Supreme Court has held that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, and why you think that that's the right standard to apply on campus as well. Well, first, just to be clear, there are, as you know, exceptions to that. There is exceptions for threats, there's exceptions for false and defamatory speech, and, and so on. But as a general matter, the standard that you stated is, is the applicable one. Um, and the reason I think the court has come to that view is, first of all, it's important to know it didn't start there. Right? It started in the early years of the 20th century by saying that the government can ban speech that has the tendency to cause others uh, to engage in unsocial or illegal conduct. 
And that meant that basically the government was able to prohibit pretty much any speech that it didn't like. So this first crystallized during World War I uh, when individuals uh, criticized the war or the draft and they were prosecuted and convicted under um, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918 um, because their speech critical of the war might cause uh, men to refuse uh, to be inducted or be less likely to be willing um, to enlist or might cause members of the military to engage in, in sabotage um, and, or might strengthen the will of the enemy. And so because the speech had any kind of a bad tendency, uh, it could be prohibited. And that's where they started. And it was in that line of decisions that Justice Brandeis uh, began um, taking positions along with Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, that eventually uh, uh, contested that and said that what you're doing is essentially giving up a fundamental freedom of Americans and of our democracy. And over the course of the next half century, the court dealing with the McCarthy era in which it failed again to protect free speech adequately, it learned a fundamental lesson, which is that there are always arguments that can be made for suppressing speech that one doesn't like. And if you allow those in authority to exercise that power, they will do so in ways that are manipulative, that are dishonest, and that distort public discourse um, in, in a way that's incompatible with democracy and in the, in the academic context, which is completely incompatible with the, with the mission of a university. So the court came ultimately to this view that in, 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 with the exceptions of few, a few categories like libel and, and threats and, and so on, um, that basically in the absence of this extraordinarily high standard, which is almost impossible to meet, um, the government cannot punish speech. And that the proper response, as Brandeis said, to speech one doesn't like is not censorship, it is counter speech. It is responding, it is arguing, it is answering, it is persuading others that you're right and they're wrong. Um, and that's the position that the Supreme Court has taken with respect to free speech and it's a position that has stood our nation in very good stead and it's critical to the future, I think, of the health of our democracy um, and the health of our universities. Thank you for that uh, eloquent uh, summary of, the, of, of that tradition. I think it will be helpful just to go through the panel and to see whether or not uh, the panelists embrace that constitutional standard. So Storm Irvin, you were a uh, founder of Concerned Students 1950 at the University of Missouri. Uh, you and others led protests that led to the resignation of the president of the university because of his uh, failure in the view of the protesters to respond to a series of racist uh, incidents uh, on campus. When you hear Jeff Stone defend that tradition and say that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, do you agree or disagree with the application of that constitutional standard on campus? On campus? Yeah. Um, so for us, speech wasn't banned. Um, however, I do think that there is a criminalization that comes when African Americans of any uh, race, whether that's on college campuses, whether that's in Ferguson, there's a criminalization that happens subsequently from um, exercising our First Amendment right. And so while no, it wasn't banned, I do think it was there was attempted censorship. So there was attempts to uh, police how we uh, expressed ourselves. Again, I'm going to continue to use Ferguson because Ferguson sparked what happened at Mizzou. Um, and so with Ferguson, what you saw was a lot of, you saw police brutality, you saw riot gear come out. And Mizzou, you didn't, of course you didn't see that, but you definitely saw censorship and um, censorship from one administration, sort of, kind of, but more so from anonymous and um, bold people who were on Twitter. Uh, so you saw the, stand, I'm gonna stand my ground and shoot all black people who uh, attend Mizzou. Uh, this was a threat coming from someone who attended another rural university at Mizzou. And so, again, I think when African Americans stand up for whatever reason, wherever they are, there's attempts to try to um, not ban, because you can't really ban us from having free speech, even though I think that is the goal of a lot of the things that people do. Just one follow-up. When the protesters were demanding that the president resign, did they want the students who engaged in the racist speech to be expelled for their racist speech? Um, do we want people who, that wasn't something we focused on. Um, no, that's not what we focus on. But I, again, so I, I recall a time of being in the street uh, during the homecoming parade when we were out there in the homecoming parade stopping it. And again, that ban was seen in the way that people came into the came into the street and stood against us and shoved us off the street. And then you saw police officers pushing us out of the street. So again, while there, you can't ban us, there is an attempt to police how we utilize our free expression and our First Amendment. 
Great. So as I hear you speaking, I'm not, just to, you're not questioning the idea that that First Amendment standard should apply, but you want to make sure that it protects the speech of protesters and is not invoked to expel the, the, the racist students, that basically you thought the administration should have responded in other ways. So yeah, they should have expelled. So students who, again, if you use racial slurs on campus, if you do any kind of racist, hateful, blatant racist act, you should be expelled. But again, our target was more so the administration who allowed people to do these types of things. So again, our focus wasn't to have them expelled, but should they have been expelled? Yes. Okay, so then there is a difference between Jeff Stone's view and yours about whether or not the First Amendment would protect students who engage in racist speech. Uh, uh, Professor Stone says they are protected by the First Amendment and you think they should be expelled. I think people who counter protest our beliefs should be protected under the First Amendment. It's once your, um, once your speech becomes harmful, once it's a racial slur, once it's being called a nigger versus I don't think you guys should be here at the campsite, I don't think you should be here at the campsite is a valid counter protest to what we were doing versus um, you're, you're not human, you're inhumane, or you're not even American, or you're not even black or whatever, they, to, in, to um, dehumanize us, to try to hurt us verbally, that sh should not be protected because again, that incites harm. Okay, um, excellent. Thank you for that very good exchange. Uh, Floyd Abrams, we've already seen a, an important difference uh, surface between Storm Nerva and, and uh, Professor Stone. You have said in a recent speech that uh, free speech is on, in crisis uh, because of the situation on campus, uh, do you uh, defend the Supreme Court standard that Jeff Stone defended, that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? And who, who do you agree with as you hear mm. Jeff Stone and Storm Irvin talk? Uh, mm. Do you believe that students should or not be able to be expelled because of their racist speech? It's hard, isn't it? Uh, uh, let, let me start with just one background principle. The, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, uh, applies only to the government, right? So uh, it is a protection. It was meant to be a protection against the government. Uh, that's why Jefferson, writing from Paris and objecting to the fact that the Constitution, as it had been drafted and agreed upon here in Philadelphia, had not included the Bill of Rights because his view and the view of many ultimately the prevailing view, was that it was absolutely necessary to write down, not just to think, but to write down certain basic principles which would govern the act uh, of governments. Now in universities, a state university is the government. It's treated as the government, just the same as if it were anything else, any, a government entity. Private schools are not. Many, even most private schools, hold themselves out as applying First Amendment-like standards. They don't have to, legally. They're, they're not bound by the First Amendment. It's a private institution. They can't violate laws, but, but they aren't bound by the First Amendment. Now, uh, my answer then to your question. Uh, I think it is, very important, very, very important, notwithstanding that there's a terrible price we have to pay for it, to limit the power of the government over speech. There are enormous social interests which are very real, the anti-discrimination interest, for one, the, the egalitarian interest, national security, personal reputation, lots and lots of genuine, real, not feigned, not made up sort of interests. But the problem that we learned, uh, as Jeff described in going through American history until, you know, the last, I would say, the middle of the 20th century, the, the problem was that government sometimes in good faith and sometimes in bad faith, but invariably, made these exceptions into the rule. That, that they were, let's take them at their best. Concerned about national security, they adopt an Espionage Act uh, in 1917, which bans almost any talk about the national defense on its face. Uh, libel law, uh, which, like England, 
uh, but not now, like America, which if you got something wrong in an article that you wrote, no matter how hard you tried, no matter whether you were negligent or not, you were liable. You were, you were responsible in the law. And in these areas and lots and lots of others, what we found was that the exceptions ate up the rule, that the rule of free speech was overcome by the exceptions, well, you know, we, we have to be reasonable here and there and there and there. And it got to be so big so often that the Supreme Court, really starting in the 1960s, I would say, adopting those earlier dissents of Holmes and Brandeis and applying them, that, that starting then, the, the court started to have much broader articulations of what the First Amendment was about and, and how it should protect us. And one of the places that it's gotten to is what you asked me about, which is, you know, can the state, again, treating a state university, can the state punish someone for engaging in racist speech, college student or, or anyone else, throughout every other democracy, Canada, Europe, democratic countries, Hate speech is not protected by the law. And the European Court on Human Rights has affirmed convictions of politicians, and I'm trying not to be political now, but, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is true. Politicians who said things less offensive than things Donald Trump said in this campaign. I mean, some of the things he said would be crimes throughout every other democratic country in Western Europe, what about Mexicans, I, I, I won't go on. Uh, our choice has been to give this rather sweeping sort, almost breathtakingly sweeping sort of protection for free expression because we are that concerned about what? Putting a candidate for president in jail for taking some position, like it or not, about immigration and phrasing it in a, in a deeply disturbing way. We, we don't live like that. That's not our system. Uh, and so my view at the end of the day, is it 10 minutes now? Uh, 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 <laughs> but my view at the end of the day is no, that the government, and again, state university equals government, should not be able to punish, sorry, to expel students just for that. There are other things that can be done, but, but not that. Sorry to go on No, so no, long. thank you. This is pretty powerful. We have two strong <coughs> uh, arguments for why racist speech, I started with the hardest question, should not be able to be punished under the First Amendment and students who engage in racist statements should not be able to be expelled. Storm Irvin has made an eloquent statement for why she takes the opposite view. Uh, Dray McKesson, what is your view? Should people be able to be expelled if they engage in racist speech and why? So I believe in classrooms. I was a sixth grade math teacher in East New York, Brooklyn. I'm currently the, the interim chief of human capital for Baltimore City Public Schools. And if any of you saw uh, most of the news today, we had our own incident with a teacher today that has, uh, you know, has been most of my day, which is why I was a little late here. You know, I think that I get that this is a complicated issue and I, and I also get that the government has a, an obligation around free speech. What I will say, is that I believe that classrooms hold this unique space in the American community. This moment uh, in classrooms is where we learn how to build community, and often classrooms are the first places that uh, we learn what power looks like, that people learn how to like the interplay of power, what it looks like for strangers to come together and have to form <laughs> community together. And we also, uh, it's a learning environment, and that means something, that that has to mean something special. I worry that when we talk about this broad veneer of sort of free speech is everything is protected, that there are some things that history has taught us. We know that, uh, that hate speech often starts off very small and then grows and the impact of it grows in ways that sometimes people can't control. And it starts off by, by joking about a wall and then a wall becomes real, right? It, it starts off by saying ban a whole religion is sort of like a flippant comment and then that becomes real. And when we uh, 
when we live in a world where we allow people to say things without consequence, then I think that we create space where real people's lives are damaged. So when it becomes this conversation about if it only leads to violence, my question is like, who is the arbiter of what is violent? For so many people, so many things that people say are violent and that is real. And when white becomes the only fulcrum by which we evaluate what, what violent means, and there's so many people who get left out. And I think that that is a, a real challenge. When I think about Yale, for instance, the incident at Yale, around the Halloween costumes, what I worry about there is this academic veneer for racism. That like when, any, when, when things that are deeply problematic, when blackface and other things, when we provide an academic veneer, we're like, well, this is just like a learning community and people sort of get to explore. It's like, well, maybe you can explore, but exploration does not mean that there's no consequence. That like there should be standards of what it means to be in community. And that when we lose standards, I think that we threaten people's sense of identity uh, and safety in a learning community in a way that I think is really damaging. And I say that in the spirit of knowing that like, yes, people should be able to uh, should be able to speak out. If we couldn't speak out in Ferguson, if we couldn't, if the protesters couldn't speak out at Mizzou and in Baltimore, then like we wouldn't be here today. But I don't think that that means that we abdicate our, our commitment to standards. I think that that is real. I think that you, you saw with Mizzou with the teacher who got, uh, fired. who got fired when she was sort of advocating for the, for the protesters. You know, I talked to so many people after that and I was like, well, uh, they were like, but DeRay, she was like mean and yelling and da da da. And it's like, well, there were so many people who were like, it's free speech until it's 3 a.m. It's free speech until it's really loud. It's free speech until you're shouting down. A, like either it is free speech or it isn't, right? So like, if it's not okay for me to like disrupt every speaker and shout them down and yell at them, like that <coughs> is, like, I, you know, if yelling isn't violent, then it's, like is violent only like, physical violence, like I've seen people shift on this in a way that I feel like is really dishonest and that it becomes this thing that's like, you can speak out only when it looks these certain ways or when it's in like a, when you have a permit. So like one of the things at Mizzou is like, people are like, well, they should have a permit. You're like, well, I thought it was free speech, right? I thought that people should be able to speak wherever they want to. Like when the government gets into this business of defining exactly how you do it, when you do it, where you do it, like, I don't know if that's necessarily free too. They never would have allowed us to be in the street in Ferguson or in Baltimore or any of those places. And that was deeply important to the way that we thought about telling the truth in public. And I think that, uh, we also know that that is not without consequence. And I say that as somebody who's been arrested in two cities uh, for being in the street, and I understood that going out meant that there might be a consequence, right? And people who engage in, in any of these acts, definitely a protest and definitely a free speech, have to know that that might be a consequence. And what I've seen on college campuses is, is people create this, this veneer that sort of suggests that you can do whatever you want. Um, and there won't be a consequence, and I don't think that that is real. And I've, I've not seen students of color held to that standard. I've seen, uh, definitely have seen students of color who have done things that aren't, aren't too controversial, get like called into the dean's office or things like that, that are, that are consequences. Like that, whether you got suspended or not, that is a real consequence to have somebody like call you in and force you to have a conversation, like that is real. So you raised a bunch of important points, including some examples like Yale that I want to come back to in the next round. And you asked who should be the judge of whether violence is imminent and also whether violence should just be physical violence. But the Supreme Court has said, yes, just physical violence and it's an objective test. I just want to make clear, I, I, I hear you saying that students should be able to be expelled for racist speech, but I wanted to make sure that- Yeah, that I think there should be consequences. Like I'm not, I, I, as somebody who disciplines adults, you know, as a part of my job, I, I don't think that there's like a one size fits all for consequences. I think, I think that's not fair to people. I don't think that's fair to, for, to the context, but I do think that there should be consequences in some situations. So like when, when you have a, when you, what we've seen actually happen recently is like the blackface, there've been like five incidences of blackface on Snapchat. Like it just is like, it keeps happening. And in so many of those situations, like the students are suspended for a semester and, and then they're allowed to come back, right? And like that makes sense to me in the, in the context of like you should learn from the experience, right? Like I, that makes sense to me. But there's some other things. It's like, I don't know if you beat somebody up because they were black. Like, I don't know if you should be back in the community, right? Like, I, I think that's a different set of consequences. But should there be a place with no consequence? Like, I, I'm not sold on the no consequence. I am sold on the, the consequences should, the, should fit the context. Great. Suzanne, we have two against two. It's all up to you. Uh, the Penn Report concludes that protesters should have the opportunity to be heard, but they shouldn't be permitted to interfere with the event. Speakers should not be punished solely for exercising their legally protected rights to free speech. 
As Jeff Stone has explained it, there is a legally protected right to engage in racist speech on campuses like Oklahoma and Missouri. Does Penn support that right, or does it think, as our uh, uh, other two panelists do, that the Mizzou and Oklahoma students should be able to be expelled for their racist speech? This is going to sound like a cop out, but it's not. I, I really, I don't think, I think there is common ground between all four people on this panel. I mean, I didn't hear, when S Storm made very clear, she said, you, know, you, you pressed her on the question of, and, and it's great that you're trying to draw out the clash, but you pressed her on the question, you know, should have the students have been expelled? And she said, you know, I think so, but that was not our focus. You know, her focus, the focus of the protest movement was on getting the administration to address what the students saw as this persistent pattern of racism. Uh, you know, DeRay talked about consequences, but he kind of, you know, as I heard, and for the, you know, whether that's punishment or being called into the dean's office, you know, he sort of described a continuum of consequences and said various things could be uh, serious, weighty, uh, and, and perhaps an appropriate corrective for racist speech short of direct punishment. And I think, you know, our perspective as Penn is we support the constitutional standard. It, it's the most protective in the world, as, as Floyd and, and Jeff have outlined. And I think, uh, you know, that's a, a, a good part of the reason why our society is as dynamic as it is, why we are able to uh, absorb and address the diversity that we have here. So I don't support any compromise of that standard. That said, I think we have to listen. What our endeavor really is to listen to these other perspectives that are being brought up on stage about other kinds of damage. You know, what does violence mean? What does harm mean? Uh, and take seriously the fact that that can take on some forms that, you know, maybe the Supreme Court hasn't addressed. And, you know, and the First Amendment is probably not the place to address them. I mean, one of the things we talk about in the report is a lot of this really doesn't implicate the First Amendment. I mean, many of the prohibition or the, the disincentives for speech the things that chill and inhibit speech don't come from any kind of authority, whether it's a private university uh, or a state university. They come from the peer group. They come from uh, social media and the, the hatred that can be spewed there, that can be a deterrent uh, against speech. So I, I don't think the crux of this debate is really over whether we have to adopt the constitutional standard. And I, I think it's a reasonable premise that that has served us well, and we want to remain the most protective country in the world. But there is there's a whole slew of issues around the campus as an enabling environment for speech for everybody. A campus is a place where everybody can learn, uh, where different viewpoints can be aired. And there are a whole series of inhibitors, uh, disincentives, chilling effects that we need to address you know, that don't require us to revisit this kind of sacrosanct constitutional standard. Great. Well, thanks for the close listening uh, and the uh, uh, attempt to find some common ground also for the reaffirmation of the constitutional standard and for the reminder that the Constitution isn't everything. But this is the National Constitution Center, and I do want to take another beat on whether the constitutional standard is uh, appropriate or not um, in light of the election. Uh, we just did our session upstairs right before we came down. Uh, several people said, you know, suddenly the debate looks different uh, now after the election than it did before. And Jeff Stone, I guess what they were referring to is the idea that uh, if uh, there's a fear that the president, for example, might try to open up the libel standards and punish uh, his critics, then that might make adherence to the very uncompromising uh, constitutional standard all the more important. How, if at all, has the election uh, changed the debate, and does it make you more or less determined to defend the constitutional standard? So first let me add a, a thought that one of the reasons why both the Supreme Court and our academic institutions in terms of their traditional culture about academic freedom and free expression take the view they do is distrust is the fact that if I can say, I don't like that speech, and so those in authority should punish those who convey those views, then I'm empowering them to make other decisions. And it's, if you open the door to that, you're then empowering, whether it's government officials like the Trump administration, or whether it's university authorities, to say, okay, people who advocate abortion, no can do. 
That's calling for the murder of unborn children. Those who advocate the rights of gays and lesbians, no. That's immoral. That's incompatible with good values in our society. Those who advocate affirmative action, that's race discrimination. Completely incompatible with our fundamental values as a, as, as a university or as a nation. The problem with censorship is that you don't control it. If I could be the czar forever, I'd like censorship. Because I know what views I like. But I don't want any of you deciding what views I can say. And that's the problem that's got to be faced here. And with, with a new administration, that's exactly the challenge. Suddenly one has to take a deep breath and say, wait a minute. It's no longer the Obama administration who's going to decide about what free speech we have in this country. It's the Trump administration. Things suddenly look very different. Will bad things happen as a consequence of that in the free speech realm? I think there are other areas I'm more concerned about, um, mainly because I think the Supreme Court will put a check on that in the realm of government. But the bottom line is they wouldn't put a check on that if you didn't have the Brandeis and Holmes position that ties their hands that they believe in and that they use to protect all of us when it comes to free speech. I have a question. Just oh, go ahead. Is, what do standards look like in that context? So like if a, if a student write, uh, draws a swastika on another student's door or like writes the M word and says, I hope you die or like, what do you, talk to me about what standard, because I get this from a theoretical standpoint, right? Like right. From a, if I was writing a paper about it, I, that makes sense to me. But in terms of like managing a community with real people who have real feelings and real lives and have to show up every day and learn and grow, like what does that look like? Okay, so there's two parts to that question. Um, one of them is uh, it, how do you deal with a community? And the answer to that, in my view, is a general principle. It's not by censorship, by debate, by discussion, by answering, by, by bringing people together to the best you can, by, by encouraging civility and mutual respect, and so on. Now, you won't always succeed, but the fundamental response should be civility, mutual respect, open argument, discussion, and so on. Um, but any principle of free speech runs up against exceptions. So you mentioned the classroom, right? So I would say the classroom is a special kind of a place. And in the classroom, I would say that it's inappropriate for a faculty member to use epithets in describing their students, to call their students names. Even though I would say calling people names in general in public discourse is okay, that's a setting where that's inappropriate and could be regulated. In the dorm, putting a swastika on someone's door, I think, is a threat. Putting it on your own door is not necessarily a threat. And I think the only way to regulate that is the resident's head can say, no signs on doors. Neutral rules are very different from rules that pick and choose which viewpoint is allowed and which viewpoint is not allowed. So if you're having a problem in a dorm where people are putting on signs that are really offensive to other people, the solution to that is saying no signs. Could I give an example? I, I was representing <coughs> Yale a few years ago. Uh, at a time when a white female Yale Law student was raped in New Haven by a black man in New Haven. And the next morning, uh, every black Yale Law student had under his or her door a piece of paper saying, now you know why we call you the N-word. And I was called by the president of Yale saying, Am I allowed to call the FBI? These seem like threats to me. To get that close to the person, to put it under his door. Uh, and I said, yes, you can do it. And they did it. Uh, um, uh, when we're in the range of, of you know, imminent harm or, or threats of harm or something reasonably uh, in that ballpark, uh, the First Amendment plays no role, really. So you're not but against, but you're the, not hard, the hard either. answer is, at, at the earlier question, you know, who's going to make the decision about what's on what side of the line? I mean, our answer is the judiciary, ultimately, but that's not a, a full answer. You know, that we start with the university, and, and then we move up from there. Floyd, one follow-up. I was uh, at uh, Yale Law School my last year, that uh, in 1991, when those threats occurred and they were put not only under the doors of students but also in the mailboxes of all students. Yeah. Does that qualify as a uh, 
true threat or is that protected speech to put it in the mailboxes of all students? The advice I gave is that it was a threat. Uh, that the students felt, believe me, that it was a threat. Uh, and and uh, my view then and now is that that, that is the, the idea of doing it personally. And now would it have been different if, you know, if, if they had racially hateful signs on everyone's door, you know, would that make it less of a threat? Uh, ask me next year. So this, so this, is, this is a tough question. Jeff, did, did Floyd make the wrong decision here? Well, he wasn't making a First Amendment decision, first of all, because Yale's a private institution. Um, I don't think the Supreme Court would find that to be a threat. I think they would say that, that when it is broadly disseminated as that, they would say that's not actually a threat of real violence directed against a particular person. That's hate speech. And I think the Supreme Court would say that's not a threat. Storm, back to the election when uh, Jeff talked about the possibility of a, you know, President Trump threatening his critics, does that make you more uh, inclined to support the Supreme Court standard? Or are you concerned that the prevalence of epithets and hate speech by a, a, a candidate, Trump, and his supporters make you less uh, likely to adhere to that First Amendment standard? So what's, I'm sorry, I'm kind of confused on the Supreme Court standard. What is that again? Basically, that you can't ban hate speech, that you can only ban speech when it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Hmm. Um, so I do agree that you sh can't, you shouldn't ban, sorry, I'm sorry, confused right now. I have a hard time saying I agree with the Supreme Court decision um, just because of where I stand with the Supreme Court and some of the decisions they made as of recent. So saying that, but um, I think we should talk about the core of hate speech and what causes it and like how that manifests. Because a lot of times hate speech, for example, putting now you know we call you nigger under your door. While that's hate speech, how does these act, how do these actions translate? These these are students going to Yale. What kind of power do they have? And also, as far as like exercising the First Amendment, why are people protesting? Why is that even an issue? Uh, and you know when this happened at Yale and, and the FBI was called. I mean, I wasn't born in the 1990s. I mean, I was, but I wasn't around. So I don't know if there was like nationwide Jump conversations about free speech. It does um, make you feel a little older yeah. to hear that. <laughs> I don't know if there was nationwide conversations about free speech when this happened. But it seems, again, I feel like there's a criminalization that happens when African Americans want uh, civility want to be treated as human beings. Um, I know you mentioned that one way to overcome hate speech and um, just racism is to bring people together or something of that nature. That's challenging for African-American people to, it's one thing for us to come to a room and talk about free speech when we all have utilized it. It's another thing to come to a room when you have told me black lives don't matter in so many ways and to have a conversation saying, well, I need to put my blackness aside to talk to you about why black lives don't matter. Um, or why black lives do matter. So I think, again, getting back to the root of, again, racism, which fuels a lot of, uh, which fuels a lot of uh, what goes into uh, this whole conversation. This is why this conversation is being had. What's going on on college campuses? Why, why is this going on on college campuses? Why is sexual assault a thing? Why is racism a thing? And so that's pretty much where my focus is. And so I get kind of lost in like a lot of the rhetoric right now. That's important, and one reason we're here today bringing this group together is to hear each other's perspective, as, as Suzanne said. Uh, Dre McKesson, what is, describe the harm that African American students feel that those Yale students might have felt when they received that hate speech. It's obviously not physical violence, but you described it as another kind of violence. Tell us what it feels like. Yeah, like the emotional violence, you know, trigger warning. Like when I was just at the University of Chicago, I was a fellow at the IOP and taught seven seminars. And right before the quarter started, the dean sent out that, that letter saying that like safe spaces don't matter and trigger warnings aren't, aren't real, right? And like my question to everybody was like, if, if I was a professor and I wanted to show beheadings, then I probably would have to tell students like before I showed a beheading, like, hey, everybody, like I'm gonna show beheadings. And people are generally like, okay, like that, that sort of makes sense to me. And that's what a trigger warning is at its essence is like just a, like a pre-warning that like something is about to happen that might 
like cause some sort of anxiety of, of some magnitude. And I think that that is like a fair thing that class, like if it is about learning and exposing people, like that doesn't seem to me like a, a big reach. When we think about Yale, it is like what happens when professors, like people who sort of are supposed to exist in the academic tradition, like create this academic veneer that says that like no matter what you do, like no, so if you draw swastikas on everybody's door, like whatever, then that is like you learning. And, I, and this is my push to the scholars. It's like, at, at what point are there standards, right? <laughs> that like, I, I don't think that we live in a world without standards. I think that we might live in a world, I'll continue with shifting standards, right? And that probably is for the better, not for the worse. I mean, Trump, you know, uh, uh, like, <laughs> Some uh, yeah, we're, we're shifting the wrong way. But I, I think we have shifted and made progress. And like, I'll accept that, but I just don't, I don't think, I think in the, the theoretical world, we live in a standardless neutral space. But just like you said, is that like, Yes, it's probably easier to say no drawings on doors, but when the person wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and like draws that swastika, like what does the university do? And I, I think it is damaging for a university to say like, just kidding, you know, they, this was somebody's free speech, the harm that that might cause doesn't matter. Like I think that that is like not what it means to actually build a community. And I'm open to not expulsion, like I get that but like a, a world without consequences for those things. And I don't think, and I think it's too easy to suggest that like that standards in and of itself mean that there's gonna be a czar who will just decide anything because I think that there's a way that you can make communities come up with standards, right? That like there are a set of standards that we agree to, that we hold ourselves to, which is why universities have like the honor boards. And like I think, I think there are ways that we can institutionalize this, but which is why I wanna push from like the theoretical to the practical because I don't, I think that free speech is something I've heard people say in this theoretical space, but when it becomes like brass tacks and like sort of pounding the pavement, like I think that universities, public or private, are always making these choices about like what do they put their energy into? And what I would say is that with, uh, I've seen a lot of universities punt, like Yale punted, I think, on that one. Uh, I think Mizzou punted by, by firing the teacher. As opposed to like forcing these like tough conversations uh, that hold people accountable for the way that they wield their power. And like that, that professor at Yale um, had real power, right? Like that was, that was power to write something that said like, you know, I'm a professor and I think this is okay. Like that is, that is what it means to wield power in an institution. So when you say Yale punted, you don't mean the incident Floyd was talking about a long time ago, but you mean the recent incident where the professor wrote a letter saying that maybe people should be able to wear offensive Halloween costumes. Yeah. Like if, there's no, if I went to like uh, Rosh Hashanah and everybody dressed up as Hitler, people would be really offended, right? And then and people would not be like, you know what, that was protected speech. And I like really appreciate people's, you know, or like what if people dress up not even as Hitler, but it, as like, um, as prisoners in Auschwitz, people would be outraged. It wouldn't, we would not be having a philosophical conversation about the beauty of free speech. People would be livid, you know what I mean? And there would be a call for consequences. That would be real. But when we talk about other instances of race, people are like, well, you know, like, you know, sombreros, it doesn't really matter. You know, like, it, that is like wild to me. Like, I don't think, I, I think it's a dishonest way to be in the conversation. But, but, but isn't it different though? I mean, sombreros and Auschwitz are not exactly the same. Well, I would say, so, and that's interesting. I think that there are a lot of Latinos who would say, like, you are, you are masquerading my identity, right? That my identity has become a costume for you. So, so not that we want to get into the oppression Olympics, right, about, like, who's the most oppressed, but it is about saying that, like, just because these people are from traditionally marginalized communities doesn't mean that, like, the right. damage, like, who are you to decide, like, what the impact of the damage is? Yeah. Look, I think that uh, I, I don't disagree with that, and, uh, and I don't disagree with the proposition that a university can speak out. I mean, a, a university, the First Amendment does not compel silence. The, 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 the head of a university can make it clear the standards of civility and, and rational behavior and civil behavior that they expect of students. Uh, and uh, I, I was thinking, really, as, as you were speaking, and, and that, let me make very clear, our law on hate speech is the most difficult one in all the First Amendment areas. I mean, we, it's not just we happen to be different. We happen to be different than the rest of the world because this is such a hard area and, and because we get there from the rest of our First Amendment law that it takes us there here. But universities throw people out all the time uh, who walk up to other students, an overly aggressive student who walked up to you for non-racial reason and screamed at you, could be sanctioned. 
uh, and should be <laughs> sanctioned. Uh, now, are we so crazy as to say, what, because he had a racial motive, he gets off? No, no. I mean, but, but the, what, what we punish him for is not the ugliness of his thoughts, but, but his action, his conduct. And saying that it does not denigrate at all the absolute reality of the harm. Uh, we can make up our own hypotheticals, uh, but the, the harm that you have quite persuasively articulated, I think, for all of us. I mean, the speech does a lot of harm, and this speech does great harm. It is not that, that it's all OK because people behave in this, this horrendous way. Uh, it's just that some things that people say are treated as protected speech because we start out protecting the whole universe of speech. Suzanne, I want to stick on the Yale Halloween costumes example, because that's on the table squarely. And the speech in that case was Erica Christakis, the co-master of Silliman College, wrote a letter after the university uh, had a policy about uh, prescribing Halloween costumes and warning students not to warn certain ones, saying, I wonder if we're being too paternalistic, maybe students should be able to choose for themselves what costumes to wear in the spirit of free choice and free inquiry. And there were strong protests. Some called her letter a microaggression, and eventually she resigned her position as master because she felt that the university was not uh, defending uh, her uh, right to free speech and was, and was not supporting her. Did, did Penn analyze that incident? And what, what's, what's yeah, we did analyze it. We didn't come up with a pronouncement about whether Yale or Erica Christakis was right or wrong. You know, there are a couple of things that emerged in that analysis that I think are interesting. I mean, one you know, point that was made, so what happened was there was a memo that an intercollegiate council put out with guidelines on Halloween costumes. And it was something that a group of students had advocated for some time, and you know, it sort of at the top it was fine, and it really kind of gave some broad parameters and explained, uh, you know, a number of the points that are being made up here on the stage about the the real harm that costumes can cause. And I think I think this was an important exchange about the sombrero and you know the Auschwitz uniform because they may look very different to one person and 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 very similar to another. And I think those subjectivities have to be kind of understood here. You know, and, and the other point we found from students was, um, you know, people sort of made the point, well, why did this have to be handed down by a council? You know, why didn't students just, you know, if they didn't find it objectionable, why don't they just, you know, speak speech with more speech? If you don't like the costume, confront the person. And, you know, what we heard from students of color was that, you know, that obligation, that burden that they bear to go around and explain, you know, why your costume is offensive is a heavy one. It's exhausting to do. It puts you in a situation of conflict with your fellow students. You know, sometimes the response might be aggressive, so it actually, you know, could be dangerous. Uh, people made that point. So, you know, there's a lot in there. You know, that said, that memo went on and it was very prescriptive and directive. It gave all these examples of offensive costumes. And I think that's where, you know, there was, Erica Christakis was prompted to write this kind of rebuttal saying, you know, this is too prescriptive, it's too directive, it's not giving students enough agency. She actually is a specialist in early childhood education. So for her, you know, this is something she has really studied. And, you know, she was kind of coming at it from her, from an academic angle and, and using her research background. I don't think she had any sense she was doing something offensive. I think, you know, she should have had that memo read by some student she knew and trusted. She should have thought, how is this going to be perceived? You know, is the, could this come across in a way very differently than it, I, than I, I, I genuinely believe she intended? And it did so come across. And it, it triggered a really potent backlash where she was read to be dismissing the validity of you know, the university kind of playing a role in trying to uh, deter these offensive costumes. And there was a, a clamor and a demand for her ouster uh, in her role as uh, a co-master of one of the residential colleges at Yale. And she definitely felt that the university uh, allowed this clamor to build in, in retaliation against 
her memo, which was, I think, unmistakably an act of speech, and that she deserved to be defended, even though, you know, I think she eventually acknowledged, you know, the memo was uh, not in the best judgment. And I, I, you know, I have to agree with that. I think she was blind to how it was going to be heard. You know, that said, to have her, you know, she wasn't fired, but she was, uh, the, the way that, and I think this is, goes to this question of really where the First Amendment is implicated, because it really wasn't implicated. I mean, even if Yale had been a public university, they didn't have to fire her. Her, her ability to continue became kind of untenable. And I think the fact that that happened in, in response to an act of speech, as ill-advised as that act of speech may have been, was unfortunate. And, and you know, it does, uh, call into question, I think, even you know, people who are well-intended and what the boundaries are. And I think that has a chilling effect. So I don't think the outcome was optimal. Jeff Stone, how do you analyze uh, Yale's response to Erica Christakos' memo? She, she has said that she feels uh, that her uh, speech not only was protected, but the university's failure to defend her was a complete collapse of liberal uh, values. And the fact that uh, she was not only chilled, but felt compelled to resign uh, was uh, as I say, a failure of Yale to, to, to defend the, the spirit of the First Amendment. What do, you, what, do you, what do you feel? I agree with that. I mean, I think that, um, you know, she might have written this in a different way or not written at all. It might not have been the wisest thing to do, but I think she was exercising her free speech, and I think the university should have essentially said it. They, think, they thought it was inappropriate. They should have said so, but they should have defended her right to do it. And the really interesting question is why universities have caved in these respects so often. Um, they know better, but they have caved anyway. And I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that it's a really fundamental question about what's happening in colleges and universities today. Um, and I suspect, this seems super, superficial, but I suspect part of it has to do with US News and World Report, that they don't want to be perceived in the world at large as inhospitable to minority students, because that's not good for their ratings and not good for their yield. And I think that they're therefore acting out of motivations that are, some part of them is good. They're concerned about the, the harm that's caused by the speech. But in other circumstances, I think they defend the speech. In this context, I think they're, they're acting out of, of a weakness that's not very admirable. I think we should consider why we are defending hate speech. Um, like no why one's defending hate speech. So what is defending? We shouldn't censor hate speech. Different, different points. Want to make clear? So we shouldn't censor hate speech. So hate speech should be allowed. I don't. The thing is, it, it's harmful. Hate speech isn't just speech. It's how you believe. It's a, it's how you think. It's a constant reminder to people who are targets of hate speech of their reality, which they, I mean, you can't really escape from. But in places of education and higher learning, you shouldn't have to deal with these type of things. Example: being called a nigger on campus. I can't. I cannot say, I cannot, again, defend the, this Constitution saying it's okay to protect that kind of speech because, again, while it's speech to one person, to the person who was a target of that, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's hurtful. I can't even come to the words with it. But, it, again, it incites things inside of people that the person calling it doesn't have to experience. It's a kind of privilege that we're not talking about. Um, and one thing we haven't brought up here was mental health and the impacts of people's mental health when they are dealing with these type of hateful language and you know saying I'm gonna stand my ground and kill all black people. I mean, while that wasn't protected, um, waving the Confederate flag, what these symbols mean to people? Yes, let's protect. Let's you know um, the fact that hate speech is uh, protected by the law is maybe a criticism of the law itself. You know, certain things just should not be protected. Again, I, I, I'm sorry I'm running over my words, but it's, it's like something that's sitting here inside of me just saying, we want to protect people who are putting people in harm's way. And I guess mental health isn't as, um, as big as, as physical health or physical harm, but it's a real thing that people cope with and have to deal with when you're constantly having to protect yourself from what may be said or what may be done. The president of uh, the university student body president at Mizzou was again a target of hate speech and this hate speech was protected. Do you know what it did for him? My colleague or forget that. My student activist, Andrea, she was a target of hate speech. This is not a, uh, just a conversation. It's a reality and it's hard to deal with, especially for people coming from minority communities, which are, again, mostly concentrated uh, black areas, to come into this space and then be reminded that you, your life doesn't matter. Because if your life matter, I would respect you enough to not use this kind of language toward you. 
And that's not the case. And so uh, I guess my criticism is of the law itself that enables people to get away with hate speech and say it's okay because it's the First Amendment that allows you to, to pretty much openly hate uh, or practice hate toward the next person who is here paying the same amount of tuition that you are. Mm -hmm. Floyd, uh, Floyd uh, Amos, what, what is your it, response though, to Storm's very powerful statement? She says, the, if the Constitution and the First Amendment are not taking account of the powerful emotional injury that these words call, it's a critique of the Constitution, and, and the Constitution should be changed. Well, it might not take a, a, a change in the Constitution, but what it, what it might take, and I'm open to do some bargaining here, uh, 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 what it might take, what, what it might take, is dealing with university uh, and classroom uh, and the like situations differently than certain other situations. Uh, that that it, it may be that you know speech of this sort is so searing that it makes it, not, if not impossible, uh, you know all but impossible to proceed as if it didn't happen. Uh, in terms of learning, in terms of getting the benefits of a university education. And maybe the law ought to be moving in that direction of saying, you know, there, there are areas in which we say uh, that there is, there is a, the university exists to teach and to learn and to do research and the like, and activity, even speech activity of this sort, is so inconsistent with it that we that we might might have ultimately another exception to the First Amendment, or just say it doesn't apply in that in that situation. It's a very strong, very strong argument, not on moral grounds, absolutely, but but maybe even on on uh, legal grounds. But I you know, but I'd say as well, what happened at Yale was not hate speech. I mean, no one has characterized it. And it cannot be characterized as hate speech. Uh, it, it was an elegantly written work by someone uh, who, who could only have had 40 years of education leading up to it. Uh, 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 and, and it was not either by anyone's account either meant to be, and I don't think it was read to be even, you know, hate speech. But what it was was a sort of advocacy. I mean, what the First Amendment's really about, most. Advocacy to the administration, leave the kids alone. You know, don't lecture them all the time. They're smart enough to take care of themselves and moral enough. Now, they may be wrong, but, but th that's what this is. So I, I really don't, don't want to mesh the, the, the really hard arguments, and they are, about what to do about hate speech and the American exceptionalism in protecting hate speech to, I, to anything like what, what happened at, at Yale, because it's, it, it really is important. Uh, and I, I share Jeff's view that, uh, that, that the university left the, the writer uh, just uh, out to dry. OK, we have, not OK, but, but uh, well said. <laughs> uh, very well said indeed. We have an ex a great variety of questions. And let's try to get to as many of them as possible. I take this first one as a, a sort of response to Floyd's idea, well, maybe we could make an exception for the classroom. The questioner asked, what about free speech everywhere? Jeff, do you agree with Floyd there should be an ex exception for the classroom? Or do you think? Well, I actually think there should be an exception for the classroom. Um, and do I think there should be? Yeah, I think the classroom has a very focused, specific purpose. And to fulfill that particular purpose, I think you do need to have certain restrictions. Obviously, the students can't get up and talk about math when it's a class on history. And there's all sorts of restraints on free speech in that context because it exists for a very narrowly defined, specific goal. Um, I, I don't think you want to extend them to public discourse generally. And I, as I said, I think the dorm is a kind of intermediate type of a situation. Uh, and, and again, Floyd made a good point, which is important to underscore, is the danger of saying, OK, let's restrict hate speech, is that you then have to define what qualifies as hate speech. And you know, the things that have been restricted in recent years in universities have been things like the Christakis incident, or someone chalking on the sidewalk Trump in, in 2016, um, or someone criticizing the Black Lives Matter um, movement. Um, that's not hate speech, even in Europe. 
but all those things have been now bound up as what we can, we have to silence that, we have to censor that, right? And so the problem is once you open this door, it's not gonna stay closed. It's not gonna stay tightly bounded. And, and so I think one has to recognize that um, most, 90% of the situations that have been the subject of public discussion have not been hate speech in the way the rest of the world defines it. Great, let me put on, uh, let me ask this next question. What if a particular measure of sensitivity that one minority demands has the effect of silencing another, perhaps in the, possibly even more marginalized minority from any effective means of calling public attention to a pressing and vital issue? Suzanne, well, you want I, to pick I think that, you know, a good example uh, of that is this fall with Trump. You know, there was a case where there were, uh, people wrote in chalk in classrooms of African American, I can't remember the campus, but of African American professors on a campus, make America great again. And that was investigated uh, you know, as, a, as a complaint. Um, and, and you could see why, you know, that it would be a menacing thing. If you're an African American or maybe a Muslim professor, or an immigrant professor, and you come in your classroom and someone sort of chalk this up, you know, I can very well understand why someone's sense of security would be undercut seeing that. At the same time, you know, if someone put that up in their dorm room and they're a Trump supporter, you know, and that could be seen as an offense against their roommate, you know, who might be from a marginalized group, uh, you know, then their free speech would really be undercut. And I don't think you could have a generalized rule that you can't put up any posters of any kind in a dorm room. You know, that's right. unworkable. And so I think there, it is, it's a very real tension of this clash between perspectives. And I think you say, you know, the classroom is a special place. Well, that's true, but I think figuring out where to draw the lines, you know, advocacy for Donald Trump, you know, can be genuinely, I think, harmful. I mean, we've seen that children, little children, yeah, but that you know, can't who feel be the like answer. they may be that's deported. Just an that's an unacceptable answer. I mean, it may be harmful, but I thought it was on Tuesday. What does that have to do <laughs> with, with anything? You, you, you cannot say, that, that the slogan of a candidate for, for president, well, because it is offensive uh, to, to some people, can be, what, criminal? Well, what if we had Adolf Hitler running for president of the United States? Would you say, I mean, and he, and he was advocating genocide. I mean, there would be some lines that I think we would say could be prohibited. Yeah, but not saying make Germany great again. I mean, the, <laughs> the words really do matter. Uh, uh, here's a powerful question as well. One of the reasons to go to college is to be exposed to divergent ideas. Why then are we treating college students with kid gloves when it comes to free speech issues? To Ray McKesson, I'm sure you, that's a question you get a lot. What is? Yeah, I don't, I don't have like anything new to say besides like I think that I think that you can take. I think there's like punting on standards and like if make America great again becomes synonymous with like I hate a certain part of the world then that, that means something and to act like it doesn't I think is to live in a philosophical world that is divorced from real people's lives and I think that is like a, I think that like Storm said a privileged way to think about the world I think that that is removed from how real people impact things and I am willing to concede that that does not mean jail right that like to say that like to say that there's harm done does not mean like you expel people from the world that they like like I get that but to say that there is no consequence even if the consequence is like a conversation or like if the consequence is like a I don't know like that there's a range of it like I think that that is I don't think that that's honest and I think that like we cannot abdicate a sense of responsibility to standards and that and we've never abdicated them that like if right now in a public university in the country somebody writes the N word across like somebody's dorm room, there's I refuse to believe that. And if you would, I think that is dangerous that you would advise a university president to just say like, that's free speech, like don't do anything. It just is like is what it is. Like that is a dangerous world to live in. I sent the FBI. In. That's what I'm exactly. <laughs> but I'm saying like I think that that is, and I think that that's real. So I don't. So, so yes, I, I think that there have to be standards. Willing to concede that there are, there's a gradation to how we how we implement consequences. But the free speech thing, I think, is like very theoretical. And I've been to places where they're like, well, Dre, the protesters can't yell down people. And it's like, but I thought you believed in free speech. I thought they could yell down whoever they wanted. Like, I thought, I thought that that was, how is that not free too? Or people are like, well, Dre, they can't yell outside of people's houses. Why not? Like, I thought that, like, you know, now all of a sudden it's free until you've deemed otherwise. And like, that doesn't seem very free to me. Well, there have always been these like time, I'm, I mean, I'm not the expert, these time, place, and manner 
restrictions on speech that you can't like broadcast something in a loudspeaker at 3 a.m. outside someone's house. And like we've always accepted, because they, they're not based on content. Like whether you're you know doing an ad for Walmart or a screed of hate speech, you can't do either one. You know if it's outside these time, space, and manner bounds. I think I think you you know everybody sort of could concede that, and then we get to you know the real issue, which is this you know very manifestly harmful speech that is constitutionally permissible and that we probably don't want you know, the government to be empowered to punish because once we give them that power, God knows what they're gonna punish next. And what do we do about that speech? I think, I think you say it right, which is like, there's a range, there's a continuum of, of things we can do about that speech and maybe we need some more robust tools to address that speech and some more consensus that that speech you know, can't be left alone, ignored, minimized, that it has serious repercussions, and we need to mobilize that toolkit of responses so that it becomes impermissible. It is, it is punished in a way, but without empowering the this, this state or a state actor to, to, to exact that punishment. Because the danger is that hate becomes normal, right? Like it is, is that the speech allows like the act to become something that we don't even flinch about. And like that is something that like we just, I don't know how we willingly walk into that. And if anything about Trump makes me nervous, it is that, right? It is that, it is that the wall becomes not this crazy thing that we joke about being crazy, but it becomes like a very real thing that we like look back and we're like, oh, you know, I can't believe all of a sudden there's a wall, right? Or like all of us, like I just, I think that there's like a very easy slope to get there and if we don't, I think we have a responsibility to do something before you I, I agree with you, but, but I mean, the, the wall is an example on the other side. The public voted for it. I mean, they did. They, they voted. The popular vote did not and, vote and, for and, it, and, to be There is no mandate for the wall right. at all. Right, no, that's But that's Floyd, Floyd, well, that, well, but Floyd, well, the, 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 for the but, Bill of Rights uh, can, can I come back to Emory? minorities. The majority, uh, I, I, the fact that a majority may have voted for it cannot be the final answer. A majority did not vote for About it. About building a wall? You, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, are, are you really telling me that, that there's a civil rights imperative which makes it unconstitutional to build a wall? No, I'm not talking about the wall, but I'm saying, you know, when it comes to, I think hate, hate speech is being emboldened, and I think you can also argue that the emboldened. majority is, has endorsed that, but I don't no, think that makes it any didn't. less or, like, or that right. an electoral, an electoral. Well, right. the welcome, welcome ladies and gentlemen, to the National Constitution Center. So here right. the Electoral right. Right. College means <laughs> a lot. Here's Keep another question that. that's related to uh, Suzanne's point about time, place, and manner restrictions. What, if any, is the role of reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on speech? Why does it make a difference if hate speech is in a classroom or at a rally? And why can that be banned consistently with the Constitution? So Jeff Stone, unpack why classrooms can be treated differently. Well, the, the court has come to understand, in my view correctly, that different types of restrictions of speech are more or less threatening to the core values of, of free speech and that the most dangerous restrictions on speech are those that pick out particular viewpoints and censor those. Because that completely distorts discourse and argument and judgment and the opportunity to debate. Um, content neutral rules, like you can't use a live speaker in a residential neighborhood after three o'clock at night, um, are, they, they have effects on different speakers, but they're much more subtle and they're much more sensible and therefore the court has tended to say that content neutral rules of that sort, if reasonable, are permissible. Um, and, that, um, and that for that reason, for example, a rule that says you cannot uh, disrupt a speaker, to give an example, right? it doesn't matter what you're saying, it doesn't matter who the speaker is, it doesn't matter who the disruptor is, you cannot prevent people from having a, a, a discussion um, in an open setting like this by getting up and screaming and making the event come to an end. That's a, a content neutral rule that's designed to protect free speech and it's an appropriate rule and it's a necessary rule to have an effective marketplace of ideas. And it doesn't matter whether the person who's disrupting is a good guy or a bad guy. It, you can't do it. But the basic point is that there's a sharp difference in the way we think about regulations of speech. The most problematic ones pick out points of view and regulate them. And the more acceptable ones are those that are neutral with respect to the point of view, as long as they're reasonable. Great, now we understand time, place, and manner restrictions better. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to uh, warn you as your questions continue to cascade in that we have 10 more minutes and we're gonna take a constitutional vote at the end of this.
panel, uh, I'm going to ask you whether you agree or disagree that people who, that students who engage in racist speech can be expelled consistently with the Constitution. That question we started off with about which there's vigorous Are you going to define racist speech? Yes, <laughs> yes I can. The, the epithets, the use of the N-word at the University of Oklahoma, which you, Jeff Stone, said was protected speech under the First Amendment. I think most constitutional scholars agree that under current doctrine it is protected speech. Do you think the Supreme Court is wrong to say that those students at the University of Oklahoma who use the N-word could not be expelled. That's going to be the vote, so listen hard as we think of these last questions. Here can is. I add if you could sure. ask that, it's important for the audience to understand that they used that word in a setting where there were no African Americans present and where they never intended any African Americans to know that they had said it, just for the facts. Can it I also would, make a statement? Sure, to describe, um, the, describe the facts, absolutely. Um, I just want to bring into consideration the First Amendment was never meant for African Americans or to protect African Americans. So I think when issues of um, SAE using in the N word, whatever, 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 then of course it's protected, you know, because I mean, when that constitutional, when that amendment was uh, created, it wasn't thinking, let's protect black people. Black people weren't even people. We weren't even um, citizens. We were slaves. So to try to bring it into 2016 or 2014, into the new era, then it's, it gets complicated in trying to apply an amendment that wasn't meant for us to us to protect us from this racist speech. So now you have to go back and define what racist speech is. You have to go back and to define what hate, hate speech is. You have to define these things that, again, initially were not meant for to protect black people. It was meant to protect those who were considered citizens. And but the law has got to protect everyone the same. It, it does, exactly, and, and it doesn't right now. It's supposed to, it's yeah. supposed to in supposed theory, to. but in practice it doesn't because again, racist speech is allowed. And so again, I think there's a, I guess there's no way to, one way to define hate speech is hate speech can be seen any kind of way, but if there was a moral consensus around what's right and what's wrong to, to again, to dehumanize, to demoralize a person is just absolutely wrong. But again, the reason why that isn't a moral consensus is because racism is so normalized in society. Like it's, it's a thing, it's um, unchallenged. It's why Trump won the electoral vote. Racism is real. And so, um, I think that's a conversation, a critique that needs to be considered when we think of protecting African Americans in, in particular, or any person of, uh, minor, of, of color, Latino, Muslim, uh, protecting them from hate speech, hate costumes, that needs to be considered as well. Yeah, I think there is something about the moral, you are calling into question the moral integrity of the, the document itself, right? That, like, that there is something, uh, you, you know, the anti-federalist papers, other federalist papers, nobody, nobody is writing about how important, like, you know, the melting pot of America was. Like, that was not one of the philosophical anchors. That was not a moral anchor. And that is not uh, seen equitably in the document itself. And I think that's like a fair, I think that's a fair reading of the text. Uh, speaking of the melting pot, one of its greatest advocates was uh, uh, Louis Brandeis, who's come up before. And one of our questioners is obviously a close uh, attendee of NCC panels says, this debate sounds like uh, the European view of privacy, which Brandeis abandoned in favor of his Whitney position. Are we regressing to the European view? In other words, uh, I think the, for, to disaggregate this for the uninitiated, Louis Brandeis in uh, an article on the right to privacy in the 1890s said it was fine to punish offenses against honor or dignity, but he came to change his mind because he came to believe that judges shouldn't balance the dignity and emotional injury of some against the free speech rights of all citizens, and that the best response to evil speech was good speech, and that's why hate speech should be protected. Um, uh, to, uh, Suzanne Nossel, is it right that those who are trying to argue for the regulation of hate speech are embracing a more European view, and why should it be re resurrected, given the fact that Louis Brandeis repudiated it? I mean, I'm not sure if it's a more European view, and I, I can't speak directly to that decision, but I think what is being said here is that there's sort of, there are certain considerations, I think, in how to realize a free society today, you know, given the, the nature of our society, the diversity of our society, persistent racism, you know, other factors and forces that inhibit the full participation of certain groups in our society that may not be fully addressed in the precedents that we have. And I, you know, my view is I think we have to be very extremely cautious about backing away from those precedents. And you know, even we call the, you know, the classroom or the university 
a special place. I mean, obviously, it's a special place, but you know, we have rules in the workplace that are very, very different when it comes to speech. You know, you can't put up a Sports Illustrated calendar in the workplace. You know, that's that's unlawful because it creates a hostile environment for women to have those bikini pictures up. Uh, you know, you could do so today on a college campus. And I think some people would argue the college campus should be treated more like the workplace. You know, I, I, I actually, I think there's some risk in that. I mean, I think there's something really wonderful uh, about, you know, the freedom and the, the, the breadth and the dynamism of a college campus that you lose in the workplace, you know? And I, I mean, I'd be interested in other people's perspective, but I think we'd lose something if we went that far. You know, at the same time, I think what we're hearing and what we try to address in the Penn report is uh, we need to take these things seriously. And it's also, it's in furtherance of free speech. I mean, we it, free speech is benefited. The marketplace of ideas is benefited if every group feels like they can participate fully, you know, their voice can be heard, um, they're not marginalized. So, you know, this is in service of free speech, I think, to try to get to the bottom of these hurdles. So, so, look, just on this, a, a question or anticipated Suzanne's uh, point. Uh, Suzanne just said maybe universities should be different than workplaces, more more free. A questioner asked, should the university prepare students uh, for free speech in the workplace and be treated more like the workplace? Uh, uh, Storm, do you, Irvin, do you do you think that universities and workplaces should be the same for free speech purposes? Well, I definitely don't think hate speech should be protected in workplaces. Um, and so. I don't. I. I can't say for sure, because on one hand, at the university, I do think you have more freedom to speak up against issues. At the workplace, I do not, because again, you're working for a private entity. You're working for someone who may not hold your views. So, uh, being able to, I think you should be able to express how you feel. But in reality, that's not exactly what can happen. Um, again, because you're representing that workplace. So. I do think, yes, in practice it should be, but I just know that's not the reality. But uh, Well, the reality is that it's illegal. I, I, I mean, a, a, a workplace in which people are treated differently because of their race violates state and federal laws which are constitutional. Then shouldn't it be the same at a college university? If someone is treated differently, even if it's by a peer, shouldn't they be uh, reprimanded if they treat their uh, their, their women colleague, their women, uh, their black student peer, if they treat them with hate, shouldn't there be some kind of consequence for that? That there are circumstances in which there would be. A, a professor who graded differently violates uh, I'm not violates talking about the, law. the professor, I'm uh, talking about the, the culture, the yeah, environment, yeah. the other students. It's, the professor knows that they can't well, for the most part, I know that they can't like say those type of things to students, but it's the students who are enabled by the culture of the, the university to say hateful language. And so if it's going to be similar to the workplace, then hateful language wouldn't even be allowed by students and as well by um, administration. And if somebody walked around workplaces like putting swastikas on people's computers, we would not be having a philosophical conversation about it, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't I, I really be like think a, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, oh, I, I, I know uh, you use swastikas twice now, yeah, I don't, but, but I, I, it, I don't think swastikas legally I know would not be treated differently than, than the uh, racial hatred directed at blacks. You don't think if somebody in a workplace like only drew swastikas on Jewish employees, like, and they knew who it was, you don't think yes. there'd be any consequence? Well, of course, and and, but and it's not, someone... But it's not just of course, because, it, because no, before it was a philosophical I'm argument saying about... the law is the same, and it's a violation of law for both to treat Jewish but that's or not black what you people said before. differently in the workplace. Yeah, but I'm, so hear me out, is what I'm saying is that like when we talked about college campuses, is, and, I, and I do think that the classroom is like a different, like I think it's a different space, but again, like this is my push about like philosophy in real life, is that like, if that happens in dorms, like my push should be that there is like a consequence. I'm not, I'm not advocating for expulsion, but I think there's something, real, like to act like there, there should not be anything there, I think is, Dishonest in a way that, like in the workplace, we're not ha we don't have the philosophical conversations in the workplace. Like it is very, it's immediate for so many people. Like it is not an abstract concept. It is like a real thing, and and not that. And I do think the workplace is like a very different place. Uh, but I think it is. It's weird that we even have a conversation that like we uh, that we can live in a world without consequence. In the universities, somehow become this place without consequence. Like I think that's like an interesting thing divorced from both how real people feel and how people interact with each other. 
So the one rule of Constitution Center panels is that they end on time. This has been an extraordinarily vigorous and rich and civil discussion about uh, one of our most contested constitutional issues. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to end with the question with which our panelists began. And I'm asking you to vote your constitutional, not your policy views. In other words, not whether you think that racist speech on campus is a good or bad thing, but do you think that the Constitution protects it or allows it to be regulated? And the specific question is, do you believe that the University of Oklahoma can constitutionally expel students for abhorrent racist speech? And you've heard good arguments for and against. Uh, you've heard that the Supreme Court has said that it may not. Uh, constitutionally disciplined students for speech because it offends the university's sense of decency, and you've heard arguments that that Supreme Court standard should, should be changed. So I want you to vote yes if you think that the standard is, uh, should remain the same and that students cannot be expelled for their racist speech under the First Amendment, and vote no if you think the standard should be changed and students should be able to be expelled. Who believes that the standard should remain the same and that under the First Amendment, students cannot be expelled for their racist speech. And who disagrees and thinks the standard should be changed and students should be able to be expelled for their racist speech? A wonderful, diverse mix of views. I would say it's about half and half. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a day of discussion tomorrow with just incredibly vigorous exchange of views. This has been a remarkably uh, productive beginning to that discussion. Please join me in thanking our panelists.